talk about uh, Docker, desperately seeking Ashley. Christian is going to talk about the new features in 1.12 version of Docker. And uh, afterwards, um, if you'd like to uh, enjoy our rooftop terrace, we have a really cool one. You just go that way and go upstairs and have fun. And yeah, we hope you enjoy it. And uh, yeah, enjoy. <laughs> Here we go. Thing, right? So, uh, my name's Aaron. Um, sometimes I go by the name Phoenix as well, right? So I'm doing a talk called Desperately Seeking Ashley. Um, now, I kind of feel a little bit bad because um, it's only vaguely a Docker talk. Um, I explained this to one of the organizers and they were happy and seemed to think it would be okay. So. Uh, yeah, I feel bad for you. If you're looking for a Docker talk, it's the next one. This, uh, but we did some work with Docker in this anyway. So, what's the talk about? Well, it's about uh, when these tools, um, see, so Docker is there, uh, met these data sets. So, uh, Adult Friend Finder, Ashley Madison, oh, and Make One. Um, so, as you might know, last year we saw a huge amount of data that was getting dumped on the internet. BBC recently did an article on it, uh, interviewed Troy Hunt from a website called Have I Been Pwned? Um, and I can concur there's about 1.3 billion bits of information that's been dumped out of people's databases in the past maybe 18 months. So this is a project that I use Docker uh, to manage it with. Really. Um, and that's the beginning and the end part of it all really, with Docker. So this is me. Um, as Linus Torvald says, feel free to email me and I'll feel free to ignore you, right? Um, but if you do need me for anything, do give us a call. Or Freeman. Freeman's even better. Yeah. How much louder? <laughs> Move in. That's all, right? So, um, yeah, about a little bit about me. I'm Scottish, which means I swear every now and again, so please forgive me, right? Um, yes, the Brexit does affect me. Um, this pretty much aptly sums up the problems with being British at the moment. An Englishman, a Scotsman, and an Irishman went to a bar. We all had to leave because of the English. I I'm also a security researcher, um, which makes me a bit of a prima donna before I even start, right? These uh, security researchers are the guys that keep on fucking things up for everyone, right? So, back to what I was talking about, Ashley Madison. So, uh, uh, hands up if you know what Ashley Madison is. How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> right, Ashley Madison is a website um, that was put together predominantly for people to cheat. Um, what it turned into was predominantly a dating website where men could talk to Python bots. Um, but apparently it was a, a, a dating website and it got exposed a little while ago, maybe about 18 months ago. This is the little warning that the CEOs got, um, or as I like to call it, oh shit, 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 shit time, when the hacker decided they dumped their whole entire customer database from Ashley Madison on the internet. Um, it's very surprising the information that you find in there. So, the problem with like Ashley Madison is it's a very big data set. Um, and there's a number of other different data sets that have been released at the same time, such as Adult Friend Finder and Mate One. So this talk's probably a lot more about Elasticsearch than it is about Docker. Um, so, I had an idea about why don't we index all of the data dumps. It sounds so much easier when you say it out loud, right? Um, it gets quite complex. So I used a thing called the ALP stack. Um, I'm sure most of you have heard this, right? And the uh, Elasticsearch, Cabana, and Logstash. Ta-da, ALP, right? So, this is a kind of awkward moment, right? The awkward moment when you end up replacing Logstash with curl. Um, so Logstash gave us a lot of problems when we were processing large data. Um, basically after about three days it would fall over um, and only have uploaded maybe 18 million of the 90 million documents we needed uploaded. Um, 
It turns out you can completely get rid of log stash in the Alp stack by uh, using curl. And that's maybe a little bit unfair. I mean, it's a bit of a damning indictment that I can replace your tool set with curl, right? But um, unfortunately, it's not quite true. We also use a JSON parser. <coughs> Um, so we cut uh, files through a JSON parser to make it right for Elasticsearch or the little uh, magic soup that it likes. Um, and we ended up being able to index large data sets really, really quickly. Um, so you remember I was saying a bit three days before a log stash would fall over and you'd have like 18 million of the records? This would do about 180 million records in about two hours. Um, so yeah, I kind of felt justified. <laughs> Yeah, so it's kind of like an eject stack now, right? But that's none of my business. So I, um, this is the Docker bit, right? Why did you? So I'm in the security community, and the security community generally has a mixed opinion on Docker, right? Because you know what security people are like. We hear these smart-ass comments from time to time, um, and now we've got a bunch of security people running around saying containers don't contain. Um, not really understanding that's not quite the problem, but okay. Um, so I, I use Docker for two reasons. First, I love Docker. I've been using Docker for about two years. Um, but also, just to troll them a little bit, right? So uh, all these security professionals, if they want to look at our data, it's the data so I have to use Docker now, right? But this is how easy it was for us. Um, to deploy uh, this stack that we were able to process huge amounts of data. This is the magic here. Um, just docker compose. Here's a docker file for a Kibana setup. You can see this is really nice because it's very easy to deploy plugins in either Kibana or Logstash and so on and so forth. So that's quite nice too. Also Kibana, uh, Elasticsearch likes to die quite a lot as well so it's useful having it in uh, uh, docker compose. Right? Here's Elasticsearch as well. So how do you go about importing data into Elasticsearch? You see, when these databases were dumped, um, they weren't dumped in mind with, hey, Phoenix would want to put that into Elasticsearch one day, so maybe we should export it as a CSV file. Um, it's more like, oh, we've stolen that database and we need to get it out of the network. So you get left with these data sets that are hugely inconsistent. Um, and Elasticsearch is really smart, but it's not that smart. Um, so you have to take these data files that you're cutting in different formats, such as CSV, such as MySQL, such as Postgres, um, occasionally Excel, but that's the DNC feed. Um, so here's a basic methodology that you have to go through for every single time that you want to convert uh, a MySQL dump or a Postgres dump and put it into Elasticsearch. You can't really automate it um, because Everyone has different data, the, the, the data sets are inconsistent, so one man's handle is another man's nickname, but you want them to be the same so that you can search them. So you need to analyze them and look for these um, value, key value offsets where they're not right. Um, that takes a little while. You, you put it all in, and then you realize you've screwed up in some way, you have to take it all back out, put it back in again. You do that for about three months, and eventually you end up with a system where you're able to have uh, Almost like a, who knows Shodan? Have you guys ever heard of Shodan? Shodan's like a, like a Google, but for networking scams of the internet. We've got kind of like a Shodan of data dumps now, right? So, uh, but what happens when you collect all of this data is you end up collecting a lot of metadata as well. Um, and it is a lot of data about data, just to give you a rough idea, um, when we, looked at our IPv4 addresses that were exposed through these data dumps, that file alone was 1.4 gig. Uh, and this is just from maybe uh, 250 million addresses, uh, 250 million documents. So it's a huge amount of data. All of this really works for Elasticsearch by using JSON, right? Uh, perfectly, uh, makes perfect sense for this type of project because what you want to do is have a value associated to a field. Of course, is the next problem. Any problem that you get as a web developer, you will get converting MySQL documents into JSON. Because say you've got a dating website where you've allowed people to put in their, you know, their title, as you would expect. Um, they put in smiley faces and stuff like this. You can imagine that Jason's not too happy about this, right? Um, man has read far too many dating profiles to ever be happy anymore, right? Um, it took us a while, but we fixed that problem. 
This is an example of the sort of data you get back from, I think this one is Ashley Madison. Um, the data has been uh, sanitized, this isn't genuine data. Um, fields and one are have changed. But as you can see, um, this is a dating website. This is the information that this company uh, had exposed on the internet. Um, we'll talk about some of the silly things that they did as well, which are quite funny. Another example, um, Ashley Madison was split over four data sets. So basically what ends up happening is your tool chain becomes set um, because you have all these files, huge files, that need to be edited in place before you can upload them. So changing stuff like handle to nickname or changing postcode to zip and having this uniform throughout a data set, right? Um, and if you don't, it just gets complicated. Um, so yeah, like said, it's been like zero days since said last saved me, right? And if you've ever dealt with Elasticsearch, right? How many of you have dealt with Elasticsearch? Yeah, dynamic mapping, the quickest way to set your house on fire at any one go, right? Um, yeah, I learned the hard way with dynamic mapping. There's no, like, they don't make it as clear in the document that if you allow dynamic mapping to happen, it's probably going to hurt you. Um, but that took me a while to work out. And eventually, and if you don't know what dynamic mapping is, it's a lot like database schemas in some ways. But this is what happens, you end up producing files that tell Elasticsearch what the type of data is that you're storing. Um, Elasticsearch can do it dynamically, but let's take the question of like um, postcodes and zip codes, right? So if you do dynamic mapping with Elasticsearch and your first thousand documents going in are zip codes from the US, um, Elasticsearch will decide, hey, this is an integral. Uh, and when you put in a UK postcode that has alphanumerics in it, uh, Elasticsearch is like, uh-uh, we, we agreed on something else. Um, so yeah, if you ever do anything like this, my advice is learn this stuff, because it's a lot more painful to learn it three weeks into a project than learning it just before you started, right? Elasticsearch is security. Um, well, Elasticsearch fixed a lot of their security by just not implementing any. Um, and that's just the truth of this, right? You do not want to leave this exposed to the internet, right? Because you're going to lose all your data. I organized uh, a conference uh, called B-Size Hamburg, and we had a speaker two years ago that was talking about making bots with Elasticsearch, right? Because you have all of these Elasticsearch servers out on the internet that have no like access control in front of them. And they're all beefy machines. So um, my little gripe about Elasticsearch is that they do now have a security plugin. Um, but it's a commercial plugin you have to buy. Uh, which is nice, isn't it, that uh, security is now definitely a feature, right? Um, well done, guys. Um, so yeah, don't expose your elastic searches to the internet unless you've got like a firewall in front of it because x-delete is not cool, right? So yeah, when I learned about elastic search, I did what everyone does and go on to YouTube and it was great because I had a lot of people telling me about, wow, my documents, that we've got six gigs worth of documents. And at this point, um, I kind of feel it's, you know, it's art, it's a little bit cute. Our, our data says 706 gig. Um, we cover 2.6 billion different pieces of information. And this is just data that's been dumped on the internet. That we've also uh, generated data such as password hashes. Um, so yeah, we've got about 40 indexes, which means that we've got about 30 um, databases that have been dumped by hackers on the internet. And what it's really useful for is understanding password culture because it's still quite a problem. Um, so passwords, I'm going to ask a question. How many of you are like, get paid to develop software? Right? Okay. I'm sorry to do this to you, but while we're here, we should totally have a talk about how guys are storing uh, passwords, right? Because um, a lot of this wouldn't be possible if people were salting their hashes, right? And if you don't think this is happening, let's have uh, an interesting walk down there. So why am I talking to you? Because you're developers, right? There is a developer in every one of these single data sets that decided, no, I'm not going to salt that hash. I'm just going to roll with it. It's all good. No problems. And then four years later, they end up being slimed in someone's presentation, right? 
Um, so this is, I'm not trying to like lecture you, but please, please think about how you're storing passwords because I'm gonna tell you, there's a lot of people out there that screwed this shit up hugely. Um, so we have just over 1.2 billion different hashes of N unsalted ND5s and uh, SHA ones, right? But why would you need that? Well, because necessity is the mother of all innovation. Because we have so much data in our data sets that are SHA-1 hashes, um, straight hashes like LinkedIn. 2012 it was discovered that LinkedIn didn't sort their hashes whatsoever at all. The straight SHA-1s, um, you can maybe build something a little bit like Elasticsearch, but like rainbow tables, elastic tables, you can build big uh, SHA-1 hashes and brute force all of those passwords inside LinkedIn because they didn't salt their passwords. Um, you can bet that LinkedIn is salting their passwords now. But LinkedIn was 120 odd million documents. That's a lot of password data that you're able to start to look through and understand, right? Um, yes, salt your hashes. Please, whatever you do, don't use a static salt. You may look at, like, he's, uh, he's teaching me to suck eggs, but Tumblr, Tumblr used a static salt on their website for their SHA ones. And now they've got every password cracker that's ever walked the earth and still breathing, apparently cracking their static salt. When that happens, that'll be about 300 million new passwords that go out into the public. Password reuse is a huge problem. Um, so yeah, salt the hashes, right? How many of you know of Chris Roberts? Right. This is a life lesson about how much trouble you can get into with one tweet. Um, Chris Roberts is a uh, security, sort of a security researcher now. He used to run a company called One World Labs. And I know Chris personally. He's quite a cool dude. And he's been researching um, vulnerabilities in airplanes for a number of years. He's been talking about it for as long as I've known him. Um, and he's found a whole host of stuff in Boeing over the years, right? He makes this one tweet on a plane from Denver to Colorado and basically says, oh, it's this type of system. Shall I just turn on the oxygen masks for everyone? Um, didn't do anything. It was just, just taking a piss because that's Chris. The two FBI officials waiting for him at Colorado, on the other hand, had a different opinion, seized his laptop. Um, and then as internet security folks do, we had our InfoSec drama moment. Um, and Chris got a lot of pitchforks and, you know, a lot of hate. Um, this, what got me is, oh, he endangered everybody's life. Now, he's a hacker on the plane. There's no way he's hacking the plane that he's flying on, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And you read the headlines from it, you know, jet flies sideways. And what he was talking about is how he'd found a, a, an overflow in the software, he had an emulated back at home, um, and he was able to increase the thrust on one engine in the emulator at home. Um, however, uh, the media reported that as, oh my God, hacker makes plane fly sideways. Um, which is cool, because now I barrel roll every time I speak to him, right? But doing a Chris Roberts is searching for information on Boeing, because I thought that's the only, the best way that I uh, could remember that situation. Because every time I get a new data set, Boeing is the first people I search for, and it's only because of Chris Roberts. So, to give you a rough idea about how crazy it is out there, how much data has been dumped, we have nearly 44,000 uh, <coughs> Boeing email addresses, their corporate identity. This is not so much of a worry, right, because a lot of this is LinkedIn, and you would expect people to have their corporate email address associated to LinkedIn. By the way, don't do it, it's a really bad idea. Um, so you could, would understand quite a lot why there's so many Boeing addresses in there. Apart from the 252 at Ashley Madison that registered with their Boeing email address. And they're all up and down the corporate uh, ladder, right? It's, it's not just factory workers, it's finance directors and so on and so forth. I'm not sure where we're failing at, uh, at maybe not explaining to, 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 to users that you really don't want to associate your private personal with your work because you might end up becoming someone's slide deck. Um, but if you think that's bad, 
This is a search that reveals um, there's seven users of Boeing that think using password is a good idea for their LinkedIn accounts. <laughs> you know that they make the planes that you guys probably fly, right? Then you get in and you, right? Seven of them use password. We have an undisclosed amount that use Boeing. Um, <laughs> well done. An honorable mention to the Boeing employee who signed up 13 times to Ashley Madison for 13 separate accounts with his work email address, who now has the most locked down FB, uh, most locked down Facebook profile you would ever believe in your life. Pretty much like any one of these Boeing. Um, they got a lot of blog posts because they were a big, uh, big organization. But we see this with BBC as well. The BBC has 13,000 um, users that were exposed in the past couple of data dumps. A lot of those are Ashley Madison, such as Radio 1 DJ, uh, who is Drive Time Radio 1. Uh, he's in there too, right? I don't know why you would be a celebrity and sign up with your work email address to a cheating website. Um, I think we're failing at explaining risk. But that's not too bad, right? Because there's 681 users who use their info at wildcarddomain.de to uh, sign up for Ashley Madison as well. I looked at these figures when I was talking to investors about watering hole techniques. Uh, so this is kind of like a tax um, where you target um, big company supply chains um, because they've, they've kind of got softer security is the theory. Um, so this is where we come across this because there's a lot of info and contact and all of these sort of email addresses at these private domains and they all have shockingly poor uh, security, uh, poor passwords, or like we've noticed that people are waiting for the who is data to drop out so that the domain expires buying it and then password resetting and compromising accounts that way. Actually happened with a, a Twitter account a couple of years ago as well. But that's not too bad because there's 12 accounts that had admin. So you've got people that are admins of their domains putting their passwords into Ashley Madison with their corporate uh, email. Yeah, well, you know, security people, right? We always like to bark orders and not follow them. So there's 19 that signed up with their security uh, website. Well done. Even when um, websites do a good job with uh, encrypting their passwords, which is very hard to say with Adobe because they didn't do a good job whatsoever at all. They completely screwed up how they store data and you're able to now predict what their uh, password like this from the patch. But that's all null and void when you have unencrypted password hints in the database. So Adobe had their database dumped recently. It's around 360 million accounts. Um, and what you have in there is um, an encrypted uh, password string but an unencrypted uh, password hint. This is the, you know, the large number of people that have the usual as their password hint. Um, bearing in mind with the data that's been collected, that's not actually that hard to work out. Um, there's a lot of password re reuse going on. There's a lot of bright sparks that actually put their password in the password hint field. Um, <laughs> which is really handy because that worked to do a lot of dictionary attacks against, uh, against the Adobe data set, right? Because we kind of knew what password was because someone put it in the hint. Well done. Now, I'm not too sure, but somehow along the lines you end up getting into big data. Um, drink them if you've got them, right? Um, it's kind of hard to define what big data is. And I think this pretty much sums it up. If you can't open it in Excel, it's big data. Um, and this is the DevOps Barat, if you're wondering, right? Phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, big data. Um, <laughs> the problem, as I said earlier on, I touched on earlier on, is that you have these inconsistent data sets. Um, what's even more worrying is when you see inconsistent data sets in the same data set. So, Adult Friend Finder, um, there's two sets of files to them that are very different. Um, and you're like, wow, how do you have half your data looks like this and then you've changed the way your other half of your data looks? Okay, no wonder you got hacked by someone, right? You, you, you can't even keep in time with your own data. Uh, and as I said before with the inconsistency, you're back to set again, right? Or I would suggest 
who uses said on really big files? How long did you, if you haven't, how long did it take you to work out not to do it in line? If you do it in line, if you use the dash i, you increase the time that said has to work exponentially. So if you just uh, stream it without inlining it, you can start to take these big data sets that took three or four hours to go through and change uh, field names. Um, you can do it without the inline select and you'll get, you'll get it maybe around 30% quicker than you would have uh, with it being in line. I'm ashamed to say that that took me an awfully long, long time to find that out, right? Of like four months later, um, you, you can imagine how much man hours was wasted along the lines, right? Um, also, what's interesting with the data side of it is, is that you, um, you end up with a lot of data that you don't need, right? Like negative values. Because this isn't a database, it's a document store, right? We don't need values that represent something isn't on. We just need the value to represent something is on. Such as with um, the Ashley Madison, there is a flag that says is valid one. And what this represents is someone who clicked the registration link. Well, we don't need to keep is valid zero, right? Uh, because it's not a database, it's just a document store. Um, all of a sudden, you end up saving 12 gig um, of your storage capacity just by dropping zeros out of fields you didn't know. Um, it's really surprising. You do run into danger every now and again, um, quite a bit, with Docker. Um, so this pretty much sums it up, right? Um, when we first started this project, Docker fell over on us quite a lot. And I'm not sure if it's Docker, I'm not sure if it's Docker Compose, and I'm not 100% sure that it's not just Logstash causing problems. Um, but long story short, if you run Logstash pushing a huge data set into Elasticsearch while it's containerized, your system will fall over after it eats all of your RAM. So it's a bit like that scene in Matrix, right? You know how you have to watch Matrix in the, in the code, right? Because the image buffer, right? Close enough. Um, and this is what happens to your RAM, right? Like, wow, I can't use my machine whatsoever at all. I've got 32 gigs. It's not a good day in the office, right? Um, yeah, just if you get into that situation, don't have the console open, right? Because after what really happens is you get, you know, maybe 60 or 70 million records and uh, the buffer on the uh, console um, starts to play up too. So if you are pumping a huge amount of data through a container uh, into Elasticsearch, don't run with the console open, right? I know you're all probably thinking, what an idiot, but it took me a while to work that one out too, right? Uh, I'm going to wrap up. So, this is the new head of the NSA. Uh, <laughs> it's a gift that keeps on giving. Um, there is no nonsensical pictures of him. He, he looks like this. This is his real face. <laughs> and every picture that you'll find, you'll find him like this. Right? So, they've got more data than us, uh, but we've got some, some data, right? What's really cool about having this huge data uh, accessible through Elasticsearch and certainly through the containers is that we can start searching for interesting information really, really quickly through curl requests and REST APIs. Uh, and we can start asking questions about uh, password statistics in geographical locations or in companies and so on and so forth. Um, at the moment, there's really no visibility. We know that a lot of data is being dumped, but there really isn't any visibility to what's actually happening out there with all this dumped data. And there's an awful lot of it, right? Um, a lot of people are getting hacked. Um, you can do all of this through a REST API, right? Do it all through a REST API. Um, login key. This is my final gripe about password storage. Sorry, right? You know, if you say, OK, we're going to follow best practices, right? And then what you do is you get two guns and you shoot yourself in the foot. And this is exactly what happened to Ashley Madison. So Ashley Madison decided, yeah, we, uh, we're going to use bcrypt because um, that's the best that we can use for hashing the algorithm, blah, 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 blah. But what it also had was a back door, basically, called login key, um, which was a, a, a unsold MD5 SHA-1 sum of, uh, of the plain text password. So they went to the problem of generating a bcrypt hash that would be very, very hard to brute force, but they also, 
did a favor for password crackers and said, oh, here's the easy thing here to crack, right? What we did is we purposely broke the security in our encryption. Um, just in case you want to log on with a mobile, and we, we haven't got a web app yet, but maybe we'll have one for your mobile. Uh, Ta-da, right? Um, 11.3 million Ashley Madison passwords that were supposed to be uncrackable uh, uh, were decrypted using the login key method, which is this kind of, anyone knows, it's a bit like landman hashes, right? That's how all this really stupid mistake. Um, it was also discovered around 600,000 of those 11.8 million people uh, also used their email address as their password, um, believe it or believe it not. And it's kind of ingenious, right? Because how many times have you been annoyed by password length and special characters and alphanumerics and numbers? You probably could stick your email address in there. You'll probably get through, right? Um, and that's clearly what's happening. And this is the first time that I looked at this when I heard, oh, right, really? And then I started looking through our other data set. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> there will always be a percentage of people that use their email address. Um, this is not a recommendation for you to use your email address. <laughs> Just so that we're clear. And finally, it's over. So uh, this was just a walkthrough about what we've been doing with Docker because this makes this project really easy, actually. And as you can see how easy it was to set up a, a stack um, Docker Compose up. And then really it's just a case of converting MySQL data or SQL data into CSV and all straight to JSON, whichever works for you. Um, but with Compose, oh, you have this stack up and running in <clears throat> seconds. I, I give this to other, user, uh, other security researchers and uh, it's literally the Docker Compose stuff. And the other security you like that who haven't used Docker before, they're up and running very, very quickly. So we've got maybe 10 or 15 other security researchers who are looking through the data set um, for other uh, interesting irregularities because there's a lot of historical data here. Listen, fun facts for you, right? Um, so did you know I did a search for passwords in the, uh, in, in, we call it Jekyll. Um, and I did Trump versus Clinton because, oh, you know, it, it, we may as well have some fun. Um, the problem is the data set is a bit skewed because I would like to see what the new dumps next year will say. But Clinton's winning this one, right? She has 584 people are using Clinton as their password in the data set that we have. Which, to be fair, only 31 people are using Trump. So hopefully this is a good <laughs> indicator. Okay. Um, I would also say, I did, if you think that when I talked about like the password from the Boeing guys was stupid, right? The thing is, is that we have um, around 60,000 people in that data set that have used password on different websites. Um, you'd think that the message would be getting clear, but we're not really doing a good job, right? Well, QWERTY, ah, this is what I was telling you about password. Interestingly enough as well, I, I searched up password, right? 72, so stick with the German spelling this stuff, right? Um, you'll have a more rare password. I searched, so I searched Verst as well, right? There was only uh, seven people that did that, but there was 495 that used sausage as right, their password. Um, go figure, right? So there you go, some interesting password things for you. But if you have any questions, now would be the time. Thank you. great tale, there's a level of investigation that has to take place, right? But the fact that they had the consistent um, details across 13 different accounts um, is, a big, is a big indicator, right? Also, that people like to use the same password over their different accounts as well, right? Um, sometimes a password is like as revealing as an email address. Um, I know that accounts have been discovered via searching for the password hash rather than the email address, uh, finding other associated ones, right? So passwords are kind of like a fingerprint in some ways, right? Um, but this would all be fixed if we stopped building apps that had unsafe password storage, right? Um, there's no real need for shell ones and MD5s, but hey, they're all there, right? Uh, yeah? I mean, the kind of service 
what kind of, nothing special, just uh, just like a, an ordinary 400 buck system, you know, nothing. Yeah, I mean, just something off the shelf. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing special that you need to do here, right? As long as it runs Docker uh, and it's got enough resources, you're fine. So you can run this on laptops and everything, no problem. I wouldn't recommend putting 700 gigs worth of Elasticsearch onto your laptop. Um, it might be a little bit painful. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, you don't need anything special. You don't need a supercomputer. Um, like what percentage do you crash dictionary? So we don't, um, we don't do password cracking per se. Um, but the dictionary attacks are pretty much the, the, the best avenue uh, that we have currently now, right? There is, use random alphanumerics, right? It, you will get around password cracking. If you are exposed, it will help you. Um, dictionary attacks against, uh, ha against these uh, shards are um, very, very successful, hugely successful. So is the silver bullet something like one password and you use a random password for every site? That's yeah. what you recommend? Use a password manager, right? Uh, definitely. Uh, passwords are an absolute pain in the ass that we've been trying to deal with for 30 years. We really should like stop using passwords and use, use passphrases, right? Um, the great thing with passphrases is that uh, I can sort of tell if you're storing my data in, in a clear text because if you limit the size of the password that I'm storing and you're not so cool about special characters, there's a reason that you're doing that and it's very likely that you're storing the password in clear text somewhere as well. So using long complex passwords like passphrases, which I'm sure you guys have all heard what a passphrase is, um, but even then, if you've got a website that doesn't accept that, um, use a throwaway password, right? Just do a password reset the next time. Um, because they're not storing your stuff safe, right? And you have to understand that because <laughs> this stuff happens, right? People are getting ha uh, hacked. Like Mark Zuckerberg, I believe, got caught out with the password reuse issue, right? Um, you know, <laughs> there you go. Any more for any more? Ah. Yes, this is a Docker meeting. Were you doing a message password? What was that, sorry? No, so when I started this, this was a project, and then like all projects, it got arms and legs. What we really need to do is two things. We need to really look at um, building the cluster better. Um, we're going to get faster results than having this one large cluster dealing with a lot of things. We can route probably a lot of stuff more efficiently and get even faster lookup times. So you can supply us a hash at the moment. Um, and we can give you a plain text of it <coughs> back within eight seconds, um, which is very handy if you're doing like security penetration tests and so on and so forth. You can do password auditing really, really quickly. But we think by moving that into its own cluster and routing, um, so that we're not covering 400 gigs worth of unneeded hashes during average search time, right? it's a very specialized thing. But yeah, we also need to reshape the data as well because it's a bit complex because you've got so many different tables. So yeah, no, one node, but will change probably within the next two weeks. Right. Super. Well, thank you very much. Uh, oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fifteen minutes. Will be fine. So guys, uh, let's take a fifteen-minute break and uh, continue our work. Okay. And uh, I said I need uh, the... You need some internet uh, yeah, access, right? Internet, yeah. Okay, I'll get you uh, some tokens. Hold on. All right? Okay. Cool. Yeah.